Just once, I want people to clap for me when I walk on stage and not for, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, 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 I really don't. I've made that joke so many times, it's ridiculous. Probably once a year, because uh, it's fresh for at least some people. Hey, welcome to Refuge 737. This, is the, this used to be the thing. Um, it is no longer the thing. Uh, we had to split into two services. We were just growing too much, and uh, the parking spaces, um, there's just not enough, uh, as well as we just want to have more opportunities for people to come and to worship God, to hear from Scripture. And uh, we've been in this series called What I Wish I Knew, and if you haven't been, uh, if you weren't here the first week and you didn't watch us online last week, we've been in a series in which we asked and we sent uh, questions to a bunch of uh, older Christians, people that have either been in college for a while or uh, people that are out of college and just said, hey, what are some things that you wish you knew when you were just getting to college? What are some things you wish you figured out earlier than you did? And the things that you hear from us right now, it, it doesn't mean that it's only for freshmen and sophomores. There's some of you who you need to know these things too, even though you're a junior or senior, right? There are some things that you need to figure out as well. You don't have it all together. And so we asked these people, and then we took the themes, we took the ones that were the most common, and we said, hey, let's talk about those so that you guys don't get to when you're 22 years old, 25 years old, and say, man, I don't know who I am. Right, you get to be 30, 35 years old, and you finally say, man, I wish I, that these things didn't happen. And so we're doing this series so that you can kind of turn the ship now. It takes a long time to turn the ship, and we want to help you guys, before it's too late, recognize what a lot of people have already gotten to and what they've already recognized. And so if you haven't been here, we actually record our sermons, and so you can go to our website, refugelsu.com, and you can look at them. Two weeks ago, we did uh, What I Wish I Knew, that you can't do it alone. You can't do this Christian thing alone. I think the bass is on and going kind of crazy right now on stage. There it is. Awesome. It was shaking, and I was like, man, there's either like a very big truck outside or the bass is on. It was the bass. Uh, and then last week when all of you were losing power, we streamed a service, and it was when everybody was losing power, um, and it was entitled, What I Wish I Knew, How Do I Guard My Heart? And so if you're stepping into college or you've been in here a long time and you want to know, hey, what does it look like to date in a God-honoring way and not leave a trail of broken hearts behind me? What does it look like to date in a way in which it doesn't lead to heartache, heartache or heartbreak? Then I strongly encourage you to go back and watch that message. It is, once again, refugelsu.com, and you can just go to watch live and you'll see all of our previous sermons there. So I strongly encourage you guys to watch that. But, but what are we doing today? Our today's message, today's topic is what I wish I knew, that faith is scary, but it's worth it. Faith is scary, but it's worth it. There's this common theme that we heard from a lot of people that they were afraid to go all in with their faith. They were afraid to actually give over portions of their lives to Jesus. This is an extremely common thing, and we hear it all the time. Whenever we have baptisms, and you get to hear their testimonies, you will hear this constantly. I was afraid to hand this aspect of my life to Jesus. I was afraid of this because of that reason. But what we realize is whenever people do hand their lives over to Jesus, whenever they do open their hands and say, God, I want you to have every part of me, that they look back and say, that was the greatest decision of my life. And we saw it again and again and again in these responses. And so I want to start off uh, this just topic by going over a story. Um, this happened a few weeks ago. Uh, there were two powerhouse high school football teams that were going at it, right? It was IMG Academy from Florida. They are like the greatest high school football team of all time. And then you have, and I'm sorry if you're from Texas, um, but then you also had this, this team. It was called Bishop Sycamore. They were from Ohio. And uh, <laughs> Bishop Sycamore, give it to them. You don't know about them yet. They're, they're on the rise, okay? And uh, this was supposed to be two of the greatest high school football teams going at it head-to-head, -head. so much so that ESPN said, we're going we're gonna to show this on our station. It's probably like e ESPN H the, ate the Ocho or something like that. I don't know how far down it went. But it was on there, right? And then also, Geico sponsored it. It was going to be that much of an incredible game, right? And uh, then the game actually starts, and IMG does what IMG does, and they start destroying this team, Bishop Sycamore. 
and that you can listen to the ESPN analysts the whole time. They're like, what's going on? Like, who is this team? And they start to question Bishop Sycamore. Who questions Bishop Sycamore? I don't know who does. Anyway, so ESPN starts doing some digging. Come to find out, Bishop Sycamore is not a high school. Um, they don't have teachers. They, they don't even have a building, right? Um, they eventually went to their website, and then when you get to the About Us and the staff page, it's empty. There's nothing on it. They're not a high school, right? And then so much so that after that game, they lost 58-0, the coach got fired, and I'm like, by who? <laughs> who fired this, this guy? Who's in charge here? I have a picture of their website. This is what <laughs> our site is coming soon. <laughs> this is what it is right now, all right? I looked it up. They're not even a high school right now. Like, it's absolutely crazy. And so why don't I start off with this story, right? I started this story for a good reason, okay? Because Bishop Sycamore, they talked as if they were a high school. They wore jerseys as if they were a high school, right? They scheduled games as if they were a high school. Heck, I even bet a lot of those players thought they were in a high school, <laughs> right? But they weren't a high school. They weren't a sincere high school at all. And so the reason I bring this up today is because I think this is very important of, I want to talk about what is it like to have a sincere faith. There's a lot of people in this room. You've grown up in church. You've gone to a, a private Christian school your entire life. Your parents may be, uh, they may work for a church. Um, you may have been baptized when you were a child. I, I don't know what it is, right? There's so many people in here that may not understand what does it look like to actually have a sincere faith. What does it look like? And so here's what we're going to do today. We're going to go over uh, very quickly a few passages in two letters of the Bible, in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. And so I picked those very strategically. Uh, we're going to be looking at these letters because the letters were written by a guy named Paul. And at this point in time, he's really old. He's in jail. He's about to die. Things are about to happen. Uh, eventually, he's going to be killed by the Emperor Nero. If you don't know this in, in history, like if you didn't know the Bible's like actual history, it's more of uh, it's more history. It's more of like a history book than it is anything else. I don't know what your perception of the Bible is, um, but these two letters in the Bible, written by a man named Paul, who is very old, about to die at the hands of Emperor Nero, and then. Um, he writes them to his, uh, this guy, Timothy, who's a young believer. He's in charge of some uh, church, um, and he's giving him his, basically his last words, like his final charge. I'm about to leave this earth. What am I going to tell this guy? What am I, Paul, going to write to Timothy? And so he, in his two letters to Timothy, he mentions three times Timothy's sincere faith. And so I think it's important. I don't think it's something we need to skip over. And so we're going to start in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. And this is a very obscure passage that everyone probably just skips over when you read it. But I think it highlights something extremely important. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. He says this. Paul writes this to Timothy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you also. I want to read it once again. I am reminded of your sincere faith, Timothy, which first lived in your grandmother Lois, who sounds like she made like great pies or something, and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. So this sincere faith is mentioned here. And this is why this, there's something highlighted here that's very important that we just skip over. We don't think about, right? So he's talking about this sincere faith first in his grandma, then in his mom, and now in him. In other words, there was a moment in which he did not have this sincere faith. Now, here's what I can guarantee you. Miss Eunice and Miss Lois, you know what they probably did? They probably took him to the synagogue every Sunday. They probably prayed with him. They probably taught him scripture, right? They raised him up probably in this, in this Jewish household, teaching him all of the laws that he was supposed to know as a Jew. They probably did a great job, but you want to know one thing that they could never give him? It was a sincere faith. No matter how hard Lois tried, no matter how hard Eunice tried, they could not give him a sincere faith. But there was this moment in which the sincere faith then sprung up in Timothy as well. There was this moment in which he said, hey, look, this isn't my grandma. This isn't me. This is now mine. They could not give it to him. 
Now, why is this important? Because so many of the people probably in this room, sitting in this room, when, it, when you think about why you're a Christian, you answer specific ways if we were to ask you. You would say, because my parents are Christian, because I was raised in a Christian household, because I went to a private Christian school, because I was baptized as a child. None of that gives you a sincere faith. There are some of you in this room right now where if I ask, hey, are you a Christian and why? You would say, because, because I don't do anything sexually immoral. I don't get drunk on the weekends. I try to pray. I try to read my Bible. I go to church as much as I possibly can. And you think that this is what gives you a sincere faith. But that has nothing to do with what the Bible calls a sincere faith. In fact, the Bible says a sincere faith is when we, as created beings from God, when we recognize that we have turned away from the one true God, when we started to worship everything but him, we started to worship all the things he created, we started to worship sex, we started to worship drunkenness, we started to worship pride, we started to worship lying, we turned our back on the God who created us and gave us our eye color, he gave us our personality, he designed us so intricately, and we turned our back on him. And anybody who recognizes that that and what we did is deserving of punishment because he is a perfect and holy God. And yet he offered, he offered his son Jesus who lived 2,000 years ago and died on a cross that he created on a hill that he formed, died on this cross, and that anybody who believes in him and that when Jesus died on the cross, the pain that he suffered, the blood that he shed was the pain that we were supposed to experience. It was the blood that we were supposed to shed for turning our back on the one true God, for worshiping everything but the living creating creating God. Anybody that recognizes that fact, that's what makes you a Christian. And so it has nothing to do with your church attendance. It has nothing to do with whether or not your parents raised you in a Christian household. It has nothing to do with whether or not you were confirmed when you were younger. It has nothing to do with you being baptized as a child. It has nothing to do with you reading your Bible five times a week. Congratulations. It has everything to do with you recognizing that you have turned your back on God, but God even when we were enemies, still sent Jesus to die on the cross to take the eternal suffering that we were supposed to experience. And he took that and it was nailed on a cross 2,000 years ago. And anybody that believes that Jesus took the punishment for your sin, for your evil, will be saved. That, that is, is a sincere faith. And then everything you do from there, getting baptized, reading your Bible, going to church, it is in response to what you have recognized. It is not to earn some favor from God. It's not to earn your salvation. It is only in response. It is only in response to what God has done. Here's the deal. Your your mama's faith can't save you from your sin, from you turning your back on God, from me turning back my back on God. My mama can't save me. Her faith can't save me. My grandma's faith can't save me. It can't save you. Your friend's faith can't save you. It has to be your own sincere faith. It has to be a faith that has sprung up out of you recognizing your dire need for Jesus. Any other, any other faith, no matter what you think it is, for what other motivation you may think it is, is not a true, sincere faith, only a faith that recognizing, recognizes your desperate need for Jesus. And so I don't know why you're here today. Right? I, I, I don't know if you came with your friends. I don't know if you came with your roommate. I don't know if you came by yourself. Right? If you look back at your life, why were you in church? Right? Did you, was your faith reliant, your church attendance reliant on your friends and whether or not they went? Was your church attendance reliant on whether or not your parents gave you a ride? What has your faith been reliant on? 
Is it a sincere faith that has come from your desire to know Jesus and to be known by him and to be forgiven by him? Or is there some other reason? Is there some other motivation? In Susanna's testimony, right, she hit the nail on the head when she said, hey, look, I came to college and I was like, here's the moment. Like, I've got to own my faith. I had no ride to church. I had to get there myself. I was filled with fear. I was filled with anxiety. But it was in that moment where she made her faith her own and said, no, this is not my parents' faith. It's not my friend's faith. This is my faith. And she owned it. And I want to pose the same question to everybody in this room. Have you owned your own faith? Seriously, is your faith, is your faith in your life, is it dependent on your desire to be saved by Jesus because of your sin? Or is it something else? Is it somebody else? You might be here for a girl. You might be here because your parents made you. I don't know why. But there comes a point in time in everyone's life when they need to make their faith their own. And here's the deal. That's scary. Faith is scary, right? Big point, pastor. Faith is scary. I remember it vividly when I was your age, trying to decide, is this faith thing something I want to continue? I remember sitting in those chairs thinking the exact same thing many of you are thinking right now. I have three kids, and to them, everything new is scary, okay? Um, it could be swimming, riding a bike, Zip lining, safe zip lining, um, whatever that means. <laughs> Not the dangerous kind. Um, uh, jumpy houses, jumpy houses with water slides. Um, trying new clothes sometimes makes them cry. Trying new hairstyles makes them cry. Uh, new food, scary, right? Everything's scary. That was me. I hated new foods. Don't give me new foods. I want the same foods I know already taste good. There's weird green things in that food. I don't want it. I get it. My kid, I, don't, I don't want my kids to be like me, so I make them eat it anyway. And uh, I eat it too, to be a good example, even though I have to eat it really fast because I was just, that's who I was as a kid. Right, everything is scary to them. And I have this vivid memory of my son Noah. One time we went to this pool that had a zip line into the water, right? That's two scary things. And, uh, and it's a zip line. You have to hold on to this, like, this ball and you zip line and you have to drop into the water, right? Very safe. And he's like, yes, this is awesome. I love this. Even though he's a little bit timid, he was like, I'm going to do this. And so he gets on the giant ball and he's holding on and he goes, right? And he gets to the bottom of the zip line. And poor kid, um, he, he starts realizing that three and a half feet is really far, right, that to fall. And he just starts screaming and screaming and screaming. And there's about 100 people at this pool, and they're all now looking at my child. And I'm just like, what do I do as a dad? Like, I don't know. Like, what, what, what's, what's my response here? You can do it, son. And he's just, ah, snot dripping from his nose, eyeballs everywhere, snot's just everywhere. And he's holding on, and it's a long time now. Like, it's like three minutes, and he's crying. He's like, I don't want to, I don't want to. There's nothing to do, right? And I did what's called the pamper pole at uh, Pine Cove, if you don't know what that is. It's the telephone pole that you climb up, then you have to stand on top and jump to the trapeze. I've seen a lot of kids snot way too much over things. And, uh, and I remember there comes a point where they're just never, they're not going to jump. It, you have to pull them down. There was one time it took three and a half hours for the kid. And so I'm, I'm literally thinking, this is my kid. I'm going to have to go. I'm going to have to go like get him down. And so I start grabbing the wire and shaking it. And he's like, daddy, no. Why are you doing? Anyway, so I'm thinking this is going to work. It doesn't do it. And he is just holding on for his life because he is so afraid to let go. And it's like, I'm like, it's three feet. Like, come on, you can do this, child. Be brave. No, he's not even listening, right? And his pops is right there. His grandfather's right there to catch him, and he just can't do it. Eventually, he just, you know, the lactic acid builds up in your hand. You just literally can't hold on anymore. And he, he fell, and then he comes right back up. He's got a floaty on. Like, there's, <laughs> <laughs> you can't, there's nothing bad. You can't die. You can't drown. It's not going to happen. Uh, anyway, so he finally lets go, and he comes up. And uh, he calms down a little bit, and he's like, I want to go again. And he goes again. And I'm like, what the heck, dude? Like, it was so scary. But the same thing was true with everything else. Riding a bike, right? Swimming, trying new food, trying new clothes, going in the jumpy house, going in the jumpy house, that's a water slide. All of the things, every time they did it, they were like, this is the greatest thing I've ever done. 
And there, it's like, it's wonderful. And every time my kids are afraid to do something, I'm just like, hey, remember when you were afraid to swim? And now you think it's awesome? Hey, remember when you were afraid to ride your bike? And now you think it's awesome? Remember, 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 remember that, remember that? It's like, this is the same thing. So eat your food, <laughs> right? And so it's the exact same thing with our faith. It's the exact same thing with our faith. We're so afraid that if we actually give God our, our lives, right, our relationships, our friendships, our weekend, our time, our devotion, that we, when we finally give it up to him, we're so afraid of, man, this is such a terrible moment, but we don't realize on the other end is something incredible. It truly is, and I don't just say that because I'm a pastor. I remember vividly my high school pastor when I was graduating and coming to college. He looked at me and he said, Andrew, what's stopping you from giving your life to God? And I remember looking at him and saying, oh, I want to live my life and have fun first. Like I, I, I legitimately looked at my high school pastor that I had been with for four years. I ran slides, did pro presenter. It wasn't pro presenter at the time. PowerPoint, PowerPoint. PowerPoint. Some of y'all office jokes. Right? I, I did all the things, and yet when I get to this moment where my high school pastor is looking at me, asking me this question, I'm like, oh, I want to live my life first. That was not a sincere faith. I was afraid. I was afraid that once I gave my life over to Jesus, I wouldn't have any fun. That once I did this, man, life is just going to suck. It's going to be terrible. And then I got to this side. And I realize that the life that I now have is so much greater, so much greater than what I was afraid of. And once again, the same thing. You, might, you guys might look at me and say, come on, pastor. Like, of course, of course you're going to say that. That truly is my experience. And I can give you a hundred other people in this room that, that that's their experience as well. Constantly afraid to let go, just like my son. But once they do, excited to keep on going. And I'll say, for those people that continue on in their faith when they're older, when they look back at giving everything to the Lord, their relationships, their sexual purity, their weekends, their time, their devotion, their party life, their purpose, they never regret that moment. They regret that they didn't do it soon enough. Every time I talk to people who are older, that finally give their life to God. They look back and they say, I wish I did it sooner. I was scared for no reason. And the life I now have in Christ is so much better than whatever it was that I had before. Faith is scary, and it requires a lot of you. I want to continue on in Scripture now. I want to go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10 through 12. And once again, this is a a man that is in jail on death row. He's about to die at the hands of Emperor Nero. And this is his final charge, right? How encouraging this is. Verse 10. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings, what kind of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. The persecutions I endured Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, this is one of the scariest verses in the Bible. You ready? Buckle up. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. We talk about a lot of the promises in the Bible, right? We talk about God's faithfulness. We talk about God's just his justice. He'll always be just. That God always has the final word, right? That, that God will take all of the pain anybody that has ever experienced and he will somehow use it for good, for his glory and for our good. There's a lot of promises we sing about on a Sunday morning and a Sunday night. This isn't one of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Let's get real for a moment. Christianity in this country, we're no longer on the home team. We're not. The views in the Bible are no longer what your friends are going to celebrate, what pop culture is going to celebrate. It is no longer that. I could see easily a day in the next decade, next two decades, 
in which many of the views that the Bible talks about that Christians hold today will be illegal, and you won't be able to, to believe them intellectually. That could very easily become a thing in the next decade or two. Now, don't get afraid. That's not, right? I'm, not, I'm not up here trying to get everybody afraid of the government or anything like that. That's not what I'm doing. But there could definitely be a day where that happens. And around the world, that exists. Are you okay with that? Is your faith stronger than your desire to not be persecuted? Is your desire for Jesus, is it as strong as your desire to be on the right side of history? Is your desire for Jesus stronger than your sexual desire? Is your desire for Jesus more important to you than your desire to get to the next level of popularity on Instagram or Snapchat? Is your desire for Jesus greater than your desire to find true love? Is your desire for Jesus greater than your desire to not be persecuted? That is a tall order. That is a tough question that all of you are being faced with today in a way that I wasn't when I was your age. And I'm facing it now. Is your desire for Jesus greater than those things? A sincere faith is scary. It truly is. Especially in this day and age. Now, we still have it really good in this country. We're just no longer on the home team. So faith is scary, but faith faith is also worth it. A sincere faith is also worth it. Now, Paul tells Timothy very clearly why faith is scary. Here's what you're signing up for. But he also gives him some motivation. He also tells him what's in store for him. And that's a wonderful, beautiful thing. He does it throughout both books, both telling him why it's scary and both giving him hope at the same time, what to look forward to. And so I want to go over two here tonight of why faith is worth it and just the motivation Paul gives to Timothy. First Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 7. First Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 7. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. For godliness with contentment is what? It is great gain. So many people think if I give my life to God, if I finally give into this godly lifestyle, then what's going to happen is I'm going to lose all my fun. I'm going to lose my life. I'm going to settle for a half life that sucks and is boring and isn't fun at all. And yet he is saying here that godliness with contentment is great gain. And so the first thing that sincere faith brings is contentment. Don't miss this, right? when the rest of the world is chasing dollar after dollar in order to feel secure, when the rest of the world is seeking sexual interaction after sexual interaction in order to try to experience as much pleasure as they possibly can, when the rest of the world is trying to get one more like, a hundred more likes, get to the next level of popularity in order to feel accepted by everyone, Christians recognize that there is nothing on this earth, nothing that God created that is going to fulfill you like the Creator will fulfill you. A sincere faith in which you let go of all of the things that you're scared to let go of leads to contentment in Christ. It leads to contentment in your Creator. And that is a beautiful thing. And I've seen it and I've preached it time and time again. It is so easy to get caught up in what everyone else is selling you and saying, this is the life. Only to see people a decade later say, man, this this doesn't bring me life. Only the creator can do that. If there truly is a God, if there truly is a God who created everything, if there truly is a God who created sex, if there truly is a God who created fun, 
If there truly is a God that created endorphins in your brain and oxytocin, right? If there truly is a God who gave us so many things to enjoy, how much greater than those things is the creator going to be? Don't miss that. If there truly is a God who created all these things that we enjoy, how much greater is the creator than the things that he made? It's one of the most logical things I think I could say up here. He's going to be way greater than all those things. And this is why Timothy, what he said, uh, this is why Paul says what he says to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. He's about to die. I mean, he's ending with this. This is what he's ending with. The second motivation here. For I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Sincere faith brings an eternal reward, a crowned, a crown of righteousness. I love what he says at the end. All who have longed for his appearing, right? Longed for his appearing. People on this earth, they, the people that aren't focused on the next life, people that are only focused on what's happening here right now, right? If all we have is this life here, then yes, chase after as much sexual pleasure as you can find. Chase after all the popularity you can find. It doesn't matter how you get it. Just find it. Chase after all the success, all the money, all the wealth that you can find because this is it. But for those of us that recognize there's something after this life, for those of us that recognize that everyone lives forever, ever, either in a real place called heaven or a real place called hell, when people recognize that, people that understand that, then they realize that the greatest thing, the greatest thing in this life is not sex, love, money, fame, popularity, or a good football team. Lord knows we all need it, right? The greatest thing is none of those things. The greatest thing is the Lord himself. It is God himself is the greatest thing that you could experience. There is nothing in creation that God created that will satisfy us like the creator himself. All of us have turned away from the one true God and we have begun to worship everything but God, thinking that that's what we need to hold on to to experience life, not recognizing that the greatest thing that we can look forward to is the appearance of Jesus and his return. Him, coming back and getting to experience Him. Not everything He's created. It's so much greater. It is so much more fulfilling. And I can't get that at a cross enough in my speaking to you. I want you to have my experiences. I can't give them to you. In the same way that, that Eunice and Lois couldn't give it to Timothy as something he had to figure out himself. So as the band comes back up, I want, I want to pose a question to you. Is your faith your own faith? Have you ever truly experienced faith in Jesus Christ? Have you ever come to an understanding that your sin and your evil, just like my sin and my evil, separated me from a perfect and holy God? And that because of that, what does it say? It says that he is a righteous judge. Right? What is, it says that he is a righteous judge. There is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. If God really is perfect, then he can't just turn away from our sin. He can't. He has to do something about it. Everybody likes to talk about God's love. We don't like to talk about his justice. And how the justice isn't just for the other evil people on planet Earth. It is for me, and it is for everybody in this room. 
But luckily, those people who put their trust in Jesus, because God loved us enough, even when we were enemies, to make a way for our punishment to be paid through Jesus so that we don't have to earn our righteousness before God by having some church attendance or reading our Bible a certain number of times a week or avoid all sexual immorality or do X, Y, Z, and then we get to earn a crown of righteousness. No, it is given to us by Jesus, by putting our trust in him and him alone. And that is a sincere faith. And it is wonderful. And I know it is so scary for so many people in this room. And then you watch everybody, week in and week out, you watch everybody to go to Tigerland and what they're doing and they're hooking up and they're having all these funny stories to tell and you, you just feel like you're missing out. But when you finally release these things to God, when you finally release your relationship, you realize that this is the greatest life you could ever experience. And once again, I'm not just saying this because I'm a pastor. I'm saying this from personal experience. I'm saying this from the experience of hundreds of other people in this room. I know faith is scary, but it's worth it. It truly is. So here's what I want to do in just a second. I want to, I mean, I want to pray for anybody that maybe you haven't made your faith your own. Maybe tonight's night where you're like, I need to make a decision. I need to make a decision of whether or not to give God everything or to keep holding back. There's some of you in this room tonight, you are a Christian. You have a sincere faith, yet you're still withholding something from God. And then there are those of you in this room, you have never had a sincere faith. Your faith has always been your parents' faith. Your faith has always been your friend's faith. And you've never come to an understanding of the gospel, the good news, that you need Jesus and so I want to have an opportunity tonight of just praying for both those types of people. So if you will, bow your heads and close your eyes. For those of you in this room tonight, you have a sincere faith. You know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but you have just, you've been so afraid to hand over certain aspects of your life. I want to pray specifically for you. And I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to embarrass you. But if that's you tonight, if you're willing, will you raise your hand? There are hands all over this room. People all over this room saying, man, I'm holding back from God and I want to give everything to him. I want to pray for those people. You can put your hand down. God, I pray for the people in the room that just raised their hand. The people that say, I know Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I believe that he died on the cross for my sin. I believe that he rose from the grave on the third day, proving that he was who he said he was, the God of the universe, and that he had mastered death. I pray for those people that are withholding whatever it is. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's their future. Maybe it's their fame. Maybe it's their desire. I pray for them specifically that tonight is the night. God, you will give them the boldness and the strength to open their hands and to give you everything and to not hold back. Give them the boldness to be able to stand out and say, man, I desire you, Jesus, more than anything else. Holy Spirit, will you show them the next steps in their faith? Finding accountability, finding Christian community, whatever it may be, Holy Spirit, show them the next step in their faith. I also want to pray for anybody in the room that says tonight's the night where I want to have a sincere faith for the first time. I've never known Jesus. Maybe tonight's the first night you've ever heard about him and you understood the fact that Christianity is not just a bunch of rules. But that Christianity, true Christianity, is knowing God fully and him knowing you fully. Christianity is recognizing that all of us have turned our own way away from God. And so if there's anybody in the room here tonight, if you say, that's me, I want to put my trust in Jesus for the first time, will you raise your hand? If you're bold, I see you. I see you. I see you. People all over this room. And so here's what I want to do. If that's you, if you raised your hand, here's what I want to do. 
I want to pray. And if you truly want to cry out to Jesus to save you from your sin, then I want you to pray with me. You don't have to repeat after me. There's not some special prayer. But if it truly is a desire of your heart, then Jesus says, I will be faithful and just, and I will forgive everyone of every evil deed that they've not only done in the past, done yesterday, but that they'll do tomorrow, next week, and the next 10 years, and forevermore. And so if you're one of those people, or you are afraid to raise your hand for whatever reason, I want you to pray with me. You don't have to pray out loud, but pray with me. Pray something like this. Jesus, I know that I have turned my back on you, that I have sinned, that I have evil in my heart, and I have worshiped and turned towards everything but you. I've sought after sexual pleasure. I've sought after contentment in all these other things. I've sought after friendships and being liked by others more than loving you. God, I've lied. I've messed up. And I know that this sin, this evil, separates me from a perfect and holy God. I know that because of my sin, I deserve to be separated for eternity in a real and true physical and spiritual death. Jesus, I call out to you to save me from my sin. I believe that you died on the cross to take my punishment, not because you did anything wrong, but because I did something wrong. And I believe that when you were nailed to that cross, you took the punishment that I deserved. And then you rose from the grave three days later, proving that you were who you said you were, proving that you had mastered sin and death, not only for yourself, but for everyone to have an opportunity to be saved. Jesus, I desire to live a life worthy of the calling, worthy of you and what you've done for me. Jesus, help me live a life to repent from my sin, to turn away from all the things that I chase after. Amen. If you're someone who prayed that prayer with me, if you're someone who, and you raised your hand and you said, I want to have a sincere faith for the first time, man, we'd love to talk with you. Don't leave this room without talking to someone. Um, all the refuge leaders and staff are wearing this shirt right here today. Find one of them, talk to them, get connected. It's hard to do this faith thing alone, especially in this day and age in which we're living when we're not the home team. And so if you're someone that made that decision tonight, don't leave without talking to us. If you are just so afraid to talk to someone, you can always go to our website, refugelsu.com, <clears throat> and contact us that way. Or you can text Refuge Connect to the number 94000. But don't go the rest of your life with this faith your own. You're not called to do it alone, and you can't do it alone. Yes, you can have a sincere faith in Jesus without anyone else. But you are not going to be able to fight temptations by yourself. You're not going to be able to live out this Christian life by yourself. Find someone to help you that can help carry your burdens in the same way Jesus has. And so we're going to worship together. We have two more songs, and I hope that we worship these next two songs in response to what Jesus has done for us with a sincere faith, not our parents' faith. Let's stand up. Let's worship together.